With over 700 games, the Super Nintendo has plenty to offer. They range from classic platforming games, to shoot 'em ups to crappy sports games, to even ports of PC RPGs. But few have the distinct honor of being the most expensive. <laughs> Just which are these? What are they like? And are they even worth the money? Before you go looking in your old room at your parents' house for some easy eBay cash, stick around and take note of the five most expensive Super Nintendo cartridges. Final Fight Guy, released in 1994, currently runs for $201. Hey everyone, it's Andrew from Metro Island Gaming. Now, we start things off with Final Fight, the arcade smash hit originally released in 1989. It was such a success for Capcom that they ported it over to the Super Nintendo. But Final Fight Guy wouldn't see the light of day until five years later. The game setting takes place in Metro City, a fictionalized crime capital on the east coast of USA. The newly elected mayor, Mike Hager, shifts all his focus into turning the crumbling city around, and he's definitely got his work cut out for him. The streets and buildings out here are just trashed. It's not like any city couldn't use a good cleanup, but Metro City isn't just a dump. There is a concerted effort of corruption controlling every aspect of this systematic decline. The Mad Gear gang own claim to the city and quietly work to take advantage of Hager's tunnel vision. Behind his back, the Mad Gears kidnap Hager's blonde and busty daughter, Jessica. They demand an end to the city revamping efforts to keep business as usual. Fortunately for Hager's sake, his daughter's boyfriend, Cody, was in town. The two of them team up. Well, theoretically speaking, they team up. It's a single-player only game, after all. They take to the alleyways, pier walks, and clubs of Metro City to bring some sweet street justice to the Mad Gear gang and rescue Jessica. Except, something was wrong. Something was missing. Oh yes, there was a third character known as Guy who was only playable in the arcade release. And as you may guess from this segment's game, Final Fight Guy brings this lost character back. This time around, Cody is stuck in Japan, so a new fighter must take his place to save Jessica. Being a close friend to the two lovebirds, Guy puts on his orange karate gi and enters Metro City. While Hager was the slow, powerful character, Guy is his polar opposite, and his moves definitely reflect that. He's fast, nimble, and dangerous with a sword. Good thing he's also buddy-buddy with the mayor to cover up all the straight-up murdering and vandalism going on. Oh my god. At a small vitality cost, Guy's signature move, the Hurricane Kick, helps him recover his footing. This will come in handy as the street thugs constantly try to surround the player. He's also able to leap off walls to land a devastating kick. There aren't too many scenarios where this is viable, but it is a fun trick to pull off when the architecture makes it feasible. Despite Guy's smaller frame, he can grapple an enemy and hurl them over his shoulder with ease. Works even better if there's a bunch of baddies in a row. Now, don't get overconfident with wrestling techniques. The same can happen right back to Guy, and landing is a painful experience. The Mad Gear gang are not wimps. Their hits deliver serious damage, sometimes even wiping out over half the health bar with just one combo. Getting tossed into the ring with two giants from the Andorre family is a death trap. Be sure to grab a metal pipe to even the odds, otherwise, guys gonna get squeezed out. <laughs> there are five stages, each built around the city's landscape. The slums, the subway, the west side, the bay area, and uptown. Each location has the same mindless hooligans again and again and again. Taking these ruffians down is mere practice for what's coming. Intense boss fights await the conclusion of each stage in typical beat-em-up fashion. These guys are straight up crazy. One guy gets the jump on us in a caged arena with a samurai helmet, two katanas, and a cheering crowd. But he's nothing compared to the hothead by the bay in a tank top, ready to bully us into submission. Their patterns will need to be mastered quickly as the bosses only know how to play to win. Now, is this game worth over $200 today? No way! Don't pay that much money for a game! Look, get the original and play that one instead. Save your money.
Definitely not worth that much money, as like with the original Super Nintendo Final Fight, it is single player only. This is a huge disappointment for beat em up fans. Well, unless you're like Guy and you don't have a Jessica to play with. To make matters worse, Cody was cut from Final Fight Guy's release. Hey, Hagar's still around though, which means buying Final Fight Guy and playing as Hagar is one of life's secret achievements. Metal Warriors, released in 1995, now sells for $203. It's time to step into the shoes of Lieutenant Stone and pilot highly advanced space mechs in the year 2102. Our task is to save Earth from the opposing group Dark Axis, helmed by the dictator Venkar Amon. Only a few pilots are left, and these brave souls are known as the Metal Warriors. First thing to notice are the full screen cinematics shown off in the intro. They are awesome and they continue to pop up throughout the whole game. As mentioned, we take control of Lieutenant Stone, a mech pilot fighting for the United Earth government. This crippled faction has one final spaceship to run headquarters. The crew may be minimal, but the morale remains hopeful. The commander briefs the team on a new mission to rescue a lost pilot trapped on an Axis space station. A simple enough job, but with what we have to work with, simple is all we can afford to tackle. Axis sees us coming and immediately puts their own mechs to work defending the space station. Piloting the mech feels wonderful, and this particular suit is known as the Nitro, the advanced mobility armor. It comes equipped with a fusion rifle, a beam saber, shield wall, and a flight pack. The flight really adds a lot to exploring the hostile station. Finding Marissa is no sweat for the Nitro, and we fly back to headquarters. The missions quickly build up in magnitude as we eventually capture a fully loaded Axis ship and use it to bombard a hidden supply base located on an asteroid. This attracts the attention of the Axis forces tenfold, but we turn to the offensive and bring the fight down to planet Earth. Underground bases on Earth are built like fortresses, with robotic sentry guns, destructive mines, and homing explosives. To even the odds, we continue to sabotage Axis strongholds and steal their advanced mechs. These state-of-the-art metal machines offer us completely new methods of combat. The Havoc suit has high speed and comes well armored with a heavy shield to block attacks. Its machine rifle takes care of enemies from afar, but when things get too close, it can swipe its destructive blade chain. For more specialized units, the Drake offers full flight capabilities, an energy cannon to pick off enemies in all directions, and a power drive to ram anything below. The creepy crawly spider suit can clamp onto any surface orientation and cloak itself for easy subterfuge. The rolling, bouncing ballistic can ball up into a defensive position until it's ready to anchor down for a charged plasma cannon shot. If flying or jumping is not needed, then we can't go wrong with the Prometheus. Nothing in its path stands a chance with the intense arsenal of aerial mines, the mega cannon, and a flamethrower. Of course, at any time, we can blast or master our way out of a suit and hop it on foot. Our pathetic spacesuit is highly vulnerable, so stay inside unless absolutely necessary, such as operating the various computers, squeezing into tight spaces, or maybe we just want to abandon our old mech for a new one. These mechs are insanely fun to pilot, and the levels are very detailed, providing a ton of exploration and plenty of enemy mechs to destroy. Whether we're chopping up large mechanical worms or stopping enemy commanders in huge flying ultramechs, the game does not stop throwing inventive assignments at us. Do be aware that the difficulty is rather high and there is no safe system or passwords, so to progress through more of the game and to see what it has to offer will require careful planning and consideration for each mission. The Axis forces are continually driven back with our efforts until a final confrontation at their main command center. 
the diabolic Vedkar Amon awaits us deep underground. He's nestled himself inside a fortified, trap-filled base representing all of the Axis's remaining power. Ensnaring us inside an oversized hangar, Vankar reveals himself piloting his own jaw-droppingly huge mech big enough to fill the whole screen. Damn! After we disable his mace, we're left dodging his machine gun, massive bombs from above, and his unleashed drones firing at us from all directions. Finally, we get him on the run, and he initiates a self-destruct mechanism and begins to flee. Red alert. Narrowly, we beat him to the nitro and make our escape. The Axis forces now destroyed. An amazing spectacle of a game, but seriously, over $200 for an admission fee? Dude, just play Cybernator or something else for way cheaper. Hawking Rocky 2, released in 1994, sells for a pricey $250. Before the sequel, there was obviously Pocky and Rocky 1. And before that was Kiki Kai Kai on the arcade, but that was only released in Japan. And Japan is beyond this channel's budget. Pocky is the name of a young shrine maiden duty bound at protecting and managing her Shinto shrine. In the previous game, a group nearby known as the Nopino Goblins have mysteriously gone insane and are losing their collective minds all over the town and countryside. Pocky meets up with a Tanuki, one of those adorable raccoon dog critters named Rocky. Together, they team up and fight to defend the shrine. Gameplay is like a top-town Zelda with a shoot-em-up style attack system. Wherever Pocky faces, she throws paper talismans known as Ofuda as her main attack. For close quarter defending, she can swing her Gohei, a purifying wooden wand with zigzagging paper streamers to deflect incoming bullets. Player 2 controls Rocky much the same way, except he flings leaves and swats his tail. There are numerous moves like magical spells and an evasive slide that can also launch an ally into a wild, uncontrollable spin. This prequel starts off pretty easy, and its gameplay is highly addictive, but the difficulty gets insane later on. Eventually, Pocky and Rocky defeat the evil Black Mantle who is controlling the Nopino Goblins. And this brings us to Pocky and Rocky 2. Time passes by until the day of the Harvest Festival at Pocky's local village. An honored guest, the Princess Luna, pays a visit all the way from the moon along with her rabbit escorts. A malicious Oni named Impy crashes the party and kidnaps Luna. Pocky, now feeling a little hopeless, seeks advice of the seven wise people who tell her she's capable of rescuing the princess, but not without her group of friends. Pocky and Rocky 2 plays much the same as the original, but there are a few key differences. While it also features two-player co-op, the assisting player merely plays second fiddle to Pocky. Only the first player has to worry about staying alive though, as Rocky reincarnates after death. Pocky has more friends this time around. Bomber Bob and Little Ninja are ready to join the battle like Rocky, but only one can journey with Pocky at a time. This adds a little strategy as each helper has their own unique advantages. There is sadly no more sliding and magic is handled differently. She instead fuses with her ally, allowing new techniques like picking up heavy rocks or unlocking chests without a key. Further in the game, more allies can be hired, like a scarecrow or a robot. The new allies come with unique attacks and magic forms, offering extra tactics and replayability. The first Pocky and Rocky featured bizarre creatures referred to as goblins. These are in fact yokai from Japanese folklore. They are a collection of supernatural beings said to cause aid, mischief, or worse. The jumping umbrella with one eye and a protruding tongue is known as Kalakasa, a neglected belonging seeking a return to relevance. And the pesky long-necked girl here is recognized as the disturbing Rokuro Kubi. There's also the sneaky Kappa ready to pull in unsuspecting landlubbers into the watery depths. 
Sadly, as Pocky progresses, she encounters more Western-styled enemies like Possessed Knights or Pumpkin Ghosts and Vampire Bats. Lame! Pocky and Rocky 2 switches course and features these quirky yokai all throughout the experience. There are Hitotsume Kozo, a naive one-eyed child, Nuri Kabe, a walking slab that rushes towards Paki, and Konaki, an elderly man who cries like a baby wanting to be picked up. Don't do it! He will turn into a heavy stone and crush you! Even the cute little girls are actually Zashiki Warashi, a spirit who merely wants to throw her ball at you. A ball of death? Pocky's seven wise people are the exact embodiments of the seven lucky gods. If Pocky ever dies by the hands of the cruel yokai, one of the seven will fly overhead and revive Pocky. Once her lives run out, she'll be left to continue at the beginning of the current stage. The gameplay is a lot of fun and the atmosphere is cutesy and unique, but the story is such a drag on the whole experience. Half of the cutscenes are Pocky introducing herself to unfamiliar faces. I mean, just look at this text go by. Riveting stuff here, folks. What we don't know until later is a man named Dinagon asked Princess Luna to marry him. She rejected his offer and the spurned lover turned evil. Now he is causing a ruckus amongst the shrine and nearby settings. Pocky gets the aid of people she meets along the way, like Mad Dog and Gordon the Dragon. The latter two offer their fast running and flying abilities to travel Pocky closer to the Demon Castle, a palace imprisoning Princess Luna. These two levels feature a change of gameplay. While Pocky and Rocky may have played like a walking shoot em up up until this point, now we're full on vertical shooter. These sections are the hardest yet. Her friends are not able to join, power ups have to be quickly grabbed, and enemies come from the left, right, and above. She still only shoots the direction she's facing, so simply dodging enemies makes it impossible to shoot them while maneuvering. It'll take a shmup master to beat these sections, and there's a nasty mini boss to contend with, and a level boss at the end. Some of these bosses are really imposing, especially up close, but the best method of dispatching these screen hogs is tossing your allies directly at them. Grabbing a friend and throwing them usually has little benefits unless there's a boss encounter. When thrown in this scenario, they take on huge forms of energy and devastate anything in their vicinity. Each ally has a unique effect, so consider the upcoming boss when choosing which friend to tag along. <laughs> Throwing Rocky is by far the best part of the game. He grows into a large tanuki statue and causes heavy damage to anything nearby with his huge balls on display. So, is Pocky and Rocky worth over $250 today? No way! Don't spend that much money on video games, guys. Come on. Hagane, released in 1995, fetches up to $514. <laughs> While most of society carries on unconcerned, two Japanese clans bitterly clash on the daily. The Fuma clan are sworn protectors of a holy grail device of immeasurable destruction. Opposing them are the Koma clan, who can't wait to get their fingers on the relic. Both of these groups have mastered the art of ninjutsu and can weave black magic at will. In a move to forever change the landscape, the Koma clan launch a debilitating offensive on the Fuma clan, destroying them completely. As the last dying Fuma member, Hagane, catches his final breath, he is discovered by a mysterious old man, Momochi. Using advanced cyber technology, Momochi is able to fully restore Hagane to life, even if the only final human remain is the brain. Hagane's unmatched skill of a ninja now magnifies through his augmented steel enhancements. I just love this game's premise, but Hagane is going to require quite the heroic ninja to back all that hype up. Don't worry, Hagane does not disappoint. Controlling our reactivated warrior feels completely at ease with highly responsive controls. Hagane's amplified reinforcements further give him an absurd assortment of techniques. To cover longer distances on a jump, quickly snap the jump button again after jumping to ball up and take off. Hitting a wall will ricochet Hagane to new heights. 
tapping a ceiling allows Hagane to crawl along the surface with his sharpened claws. When falling, press down any time to dive kick with an electrified shock to an enemy below. Four main weapons can be switched out in real time for adapting new tactics. They are each named after the four gods of Chinese astrology. The Azure Dragon, Hagane's sword. It swings very fast and hits very strong for delivering successive high damage. The Black Tortoise, Hagane's grappling hook. While it can deliver a painful hit further than the sword, its swing time is prohibitively longer. Its main use is for bridging the gap between a high ceiling and a full jump. The Vermilion Bird, Hagane's kunai. Throwing these sharpened daggers helps eliminate targets before they become close threats. Finally, the White Tiger, Hagane's Grenades. These toss out in an arc and detonate into a horrific explosion. Okay, those are some very useful controls and weapons, but don't be satisfied with just that. Hagane has a large variety of combo moves that he can pull off at will. Those steam-powered limbs can be driven into overdrive by holding the right shoulder button and followed up with the jump or attack button. Depending on the duration of the somersault, Hagane can jump kick, vault into a spiraling dragon punch, or leap off the ground and kick toward the heavens. Using the same approach with the attack button, Hagane lunges with the force of a dragon's bite, lifts off into a fiery kick, or plunges into an area of effect inferno. These moves are pretty gimmicky at first, but offer some bouts of invulnerability. Experiment and practice with all the techniques. They are only there to help and are definitely not required to complete the game. The game presents a dire and twisted world dominated by the Mr. Gokoma clan. The visual approach is quite striking and helps drive home the gritty atmosphere. The art design was handled by Keita Amemia, and his signature style is all over this game. His creative conceptions give Hagane a rather sinister look. Strange combinations come to life, like the floating rock formation with carved faces, to a tank capable of shouting devastating beams of energy. The opponents we meet blend these macabre compositions of man, machine, and ancient traditions. Its look is very unique amongst the Super Nintendo library, or any system really. Also, check out that cute little H in Hagane's belt. The game has a bit of a reputation for being tough, and yeah, it is, but it's still approachable. I mean, I was able to beat it, and I suck at video games. Standard platformer memorization will prove the best course of action to success. There are five main stages to battle through, each with their own sub-levels and ending in a boss showdown. The health bar makes up for stupid mistakes, but there are plenty of ways to get crushed in no time. Now, these everyday baddies get recycled quite often, but there are heaps of unique mini-bosses providing new diversions throughout the stages. Most levels are decently sized and require a little exploration and finesse to pass. Some variation in levels include a fast auto-scrolling stage and hitching a ride on a flying vehicle. It's the main boss at the end of the stage that holds our biggest interest. They are the named high-ranking coma leaders, each hoping to prevent us from reaching the main base of operations. A moment of preparation initiates the fight as their perverse true forms activate. A few even have multiple phases before they are eliminated. Should things get too difficult at any point, a final screen-clearing magic can be invoked. Hagane shouts a powerful dark incantation that helps even the odds, but they are limited, so don't use them until truly necessary. My advice? Save at least six for the final boss. Hagane's journey always feels fresh from start to finish, and I highly recommend it. Just don't spend over $500 on the US release. Instead, find the cheaper import copy. I use footage from both games in this review, and I bet no one can tell the difference. The highly prized Aero Fighters, released in 1993, sells for a staggering $627. All right, this is it, the most expensive Super Nintendo game. If you, as a collector, own this title, then congratulations, it's all downhill from here.
A strange phenomenon is affecting the entire world's military forces and is turning them against the Earth's population. Countries all over are going haywire. Only one brave soul. Okay, a possible two brave souls are all that stands between the doomed reality and salvation. The coolest aspect of Aerofighters is the usage of real-life jets, just like the F-14 Tomcat right here behind me. There are four countries to pick allegiance, each one representing actual flown jets from the respective hometowns. USA obviously gets the F-14, while the UK flies the AV-8, Sweden pilots the AJ-37, and Japan operates the FSX. It doesn't stop there. Remember, two players, so we get to double the variety of jets. In addition to the previous jets, another player can control an F-18, an IDS, a JS-39, and an F-15 depending on the source country. The pilots themselves have names and personalities and will offer short communication between levels to break up the aerial struggles. In Japan, the dedicated ninja, Hien, surges to victory with his ninja beam and the backup support of his ally, Mau Mau, a popular idol singer who secretly works as a fighter pilot. With the F-14 and F-18 jets, Team USA shows an obvious nod to the movie Top Gun, the planes being piloted by the partnered Keith Bishop and Blaster Keaton. The UK sends the charming William Sid Pry to battle, seeking to crush his enemies while earning the hearts of hopeful ladies, though too bad he's only 14th in line to the throne. The Lord White aids William, a soon-to-retire World War II veteran. He brings an unmatched level of experience to round out the duo. And finally, for the Swedes, Koffel the Viking strikes with his almighty artillery nicknamed Thor's Hammer. His ally, an advanced AI robot, is TB. He's set to prove he's the best against machines, and that includes arcade video games. Each jet has their own weapon that can improve across four levels by picking up power-ups. These weapons at the highest levels flood the screens with soaring carnage. This can make spotting enemy bullets harder when using the buddy system with everyone powered up. Lives are scarce, so watch it with the dying. Otherwise, it'll be straight to the continue screen. Bombs are also limited, but they're lifesavers. Deploy them to avoid impending doom. Or save them for something big and bad. The levels show off different parts of the world, but the country home level will always be forfeited. After all, we can't be bombing our own crib. Ah, nut! There are plenty of tanks, jets, and helicopters to soak up the massive spray of firepower as we blast through the town sides. Each country does give a semi-realistic vibe of the location. Hey, look, Central Park. Hey, I'm walking here. At the end of the level, a screen-wide big boss shows up ready to devour whatever's left of our extra lives. Any bombs should be used here, especially for flying out of harm's way of a sudden bullet hell. Some enemies will leave behind bonus British pounds, Swedish krona, Japanese yen, or my own obsession, the American dollar. Ha! Like a thousand dollars is going to make up for all the multi-million dollar jets I keep crashing. Various difficulty levels help those not good at vertical shooters, but the maniacs among us will want to unlock super hard mode for the best challenge. Yeah, right. I can't even beat easy without cheats. Two additional characters can be unlocked hailing from a different game. Now we're halfway to being a cute em up. After clearing the Earth of evil, we drift to outer space to face the reality of what's been happening. This time, it isn't a diabolic dictator, it's actually out of this world. Aliens are responsible for the destruction Earth has been facing, and it's up to the world heroes to put the heat on the extraterrestrials and shoot them out of orbit. 
So that's Aero Fighters. Now is it worth over $600? No way! You'd be crazy to spend that much money. No one would ever- Hell yeah, it's worth $600. So I got a down payment right here. You what obviously don't this? appreciate it. Me, it's your oh. boy, Lucius T. Woo! It's about damn time you had to do your damn response video. Uh. I told you about this months ago. And you've been holding out on me. You got Arrow Fighters, Pocky yeah. and Rocky 2, yeah. Ogre Battle, Mega yeah. Man X3, Dracula X, Pocky and Rocky 1. Wait, you don't have that. I don't have Pocky and Rocky. Great Rocky. success! I'm better than you! Alright, show's over, alright? We're done. <laughs>